you think about all of the things that we do for our mm-hmm. kids, you know, we're super strict about their vaccination schedule. We make sure that they eat well, that they go to school well. Um, you know, over 500 children every year are rushed to KKH emergency because of car accidents. Right. And the vast majority of these children are unrestrained. Mm. Now, preventing vehicular injury is yeah. an, a really easy thing to do. Yeah. But it's not something that you, like, have a second to try at. Yeah. Right? And, it's, it's, and so, yeah, like, like of all the things that we could be doing, preventing injury and death, by simply using a car seat every time we jump in a car. Hmm. It's important. It's practical. Let's just do it. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Shift with Shibra. I'm your host, Shibra Vedetti. I'm a certified child and adult sleep consultant. I'm also a baby science program instructor and an Akashic light healing practitioner and on today's episode we'll be talking about car seat safety and choosing the right pram and joining us for this conversation is Elise Mawson and Elise is the only car seat and pram consultant in Singapore. She's also a trained child passenger safety technician from Australia and the US and she's the mother of three children. So Elise comes with a lot of information on car seats and why it's important to have a car seat for your growing child, not just at the newborn stage, but even up until the age of 12. We're going to be talking about when you're going to have, you know, when is the recommended age to change the car seat from a rear facing to a front facing and how and when should you be choosing your pram along with the car seat. A quick tip, it should be at the same time. Um, but the car seat is an, it's an important must uh, compared to the pram, but both go hand in hand as Elise will be talking about. So thank you so much for joining on today's show. If you have someone that might benefit from this conversation, please do share this episode with them because it's really packed with very vital information, especially for all expecting parents out there. And do give us a like to subscribe to our channel for more content like this and write to us if you have suggestions for any additional content that you would like to see explored on this show. Thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. At least I think what would be great for our listeners and viewers is maybe you can tell a little bit about your journey. I mean, you're a car seat engineer, you have Taxi Baby that's known in Singapore, and now you have Pram Fox. And could you just tell everyone, like, what do you do? How did you get here? And, and what's your purpose at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm a chemical engineer by trade. I'm Australian. And I worked in a coal mine for 10 wow. years. Okay. And then um, the coal that's dug in Australia is actually sold from the office in Singapore. So my husband and I, we met in the mine. And we uh, so we came, like, we got promotions and we came over to the Singapore office and um, and then uh, sort of not super planned, but I got pregnant and then, you know, had a baby and um, I was on maternity leave and I was having a really hard time getting the car seat into the taxi, like a really hard time. And I was kind of like a, like a zero tolerance. Like if it didn't work, we're not getting in a taxi. And I think it was like the third or the fifth trip in a taxi and I'm at Forum Shopping Centre, which is nowhere near a train station, trying to get the car seat in. And I've like let like five taxis go because I've been like, you don't have a functional (laughs) seatbelt. They did. They just had European seatbelts and I'm expecting American seatbelts. But anyway, so like massive meltdown issues. Um, And the baby was early, so we didn't even have a stroller. We right. just had a car seat. So we end up um, walking all the way down <laughs> Orchard Road to the MRT, carrying this car seat like, <laughs> like kryptonite. And, um, and then I was just too scared to leave the house. So I did heaps of research and then that kind of, it just blossomed. And I found I needed this clip. So I got a clip. My mother-in-law sent one over. She sent 10. So at my next, like, mother's group little coffee, I was like, here's your clip. Here's your clip. Here's your clip. And uh, 
And then, yeah, and then and then the, the next week, the mums were like, oh, actually, I'm in another mother's group and they all want a clip. So I was like, oh, maybe I should sell the clip. And that's how Taxi Baby started. Wow. And my mother-in-law was like literally running my supply lines, going to the baby shops in Sydney <laughs> to buy these things and send them over. And uh, and then, you know, like there's, there's, there just wasn't anyone to ask questions to because no one had local context. They didn't understand that the seatbelts here are different and the seats that are sold here are different. And so I just I just got really into it. And then um, one day I quit my job because I thought, well, well, I was in corporate and you know what corporate bureaucracy is like. And I, was, I just, I think I, I sat through a three hour workshop where the uh, like nothing productive was generated in three hours I was just juggling two really big egos in the room and I thought that is a waste of my time like I could literally be doing anything else in the whole world whether it's like working on my own business or playing with my son um and and like what on earth am I doing so it was um it was really difficult to quit my job because I was pretty like institutionalized in the corporate world like I'd I you know I'd done uni and then I did my postgraduate and like everything I was doing it like textbook yeah yeah so so to go out on your own where um where those like um traditional structured tiers of success don't exist or don't apply it was um super scary but mm. I'm glad I did it in the end yeah, no, very much. I'm so glad that you also did it as well, because I think a lot of people are benefiting from the information that you're sharing. So you were talking about these clips and the clips eventually led to what was Taxi Baby or what is Taxi Baby essentially. And so what is the development of Pram Fox that came out of Taxi Baby? Right. So Taxi Baby really caters to car free or jet setting parents, right? people who, who don't use their either don't have their own car or don't use it for every trip. Um, and the jet setting part really killed us this year. Yeah. Um, uh, and we were um, we were just a lot more exposed to the travel market than is sustainable without a travel market. So you know, enter the dark days, which is the circuit breaker lockdown period in Singapore, where we we're all locked inside a two bedroom apartment with three boys under five. Um, and wow. Yeah, <laughs> there's like there's not enough wine in the world, <laughs> um, and uh, and you know we're like look we have to do something we're paying we've got like high overheads we've got staff we've got space, um, and we need to pivot and do something, and so we thought well everyone's still having babies, which turns out <laughs> is even more so <laughs> because what else? the people without the babies what did they do during circuit breaker. <laughs> the people with the babies that's not what they were doing during no break. no it wasn't <laughs> that's the last thing they were doing yeah. during circuit break. <laughs> so um i thought well let's get into like catering more comprehensively to newborns and also to people who have car seats uh, sorry cars in general so because we had a super niche range at taxi baby i'd get heaps but like a really broad knowledge i'd get heaps of inquiries about mainstream car seats mm. and I'd always give their adv the advice and then I'd be like oh but you can't buy that from me you can go buy it from mother care or mother's way and we just didn't have the luxury to refer those sales anymore mm. so we started working out what kind of construct would allow us to you know keep a really high focus on expertise and experience and knowledge and safety but also um be really accessible uh, and first time parent friendly mm. and, and and that's and that's how pram fox was born so so the two businesses exist in um sort of sort of independently to each other but also quite complementary so there's mm. there's not really an overlap in what they do Okay. And, and the reason that the pram thing came about was, uh, that, well, the most recent stats we have say that only 6% of kids in Singapore go in car seats. Mm. So it's not, for whatever reason, it's, it's not the first thing that parents think to buy. Yeah. But they do think about buying a pram. A pram. And so yeah. I thought, well... Like if I sell them the pram, I have a better chance of convincing them to use a car seat from birth. Yeah. Okay. And prams so are a lot sexier than car seats. 
So that's our they end. Are. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, tell me, so I, I, I'll say I'm guilty. Like when we first got the newborn out of the hospital, I got the car seat. I got an American brand, I think, because uh, I made my husband buy it from the US when he was traveling there because it's just a fraction of the price, right? Um, and then we couldn't really figure out how to put it into the taxi. So we you ended up- and every other parent in and the world. Ev- yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so we ended up just having to carry the baby in our hands and just going, right? Because we were just like, I don't know, like, this doesn't make sense. Okay, we'll just, and of course, taxi drivers, when we asked, like, do you have any idea? They're like, nope. <laughs> we're like, okay, great. So we have this thing. We don't know how to use it. No one knows. The number of taxi drivers who offer to put my car seat in the boot for me. Yeah, when they come to pick me up is, is, is astronomical. It's and 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 I'm all I'm just wondering. So why? Tell maybe let's start with why. Why is it fundamentally important to have a car seat uh, straight away from the hospital? Because let's assume that most people don't have their own car, or even if they do have their own car, when you're traveling with a newborn, you've just given birth. It's been a couple of days now. You're leaving the hospital. Why is it that you should put them in a car seat? And also what kind of car seat? Because the newborn also needs to be in a certain position um, to prevent, uh, you know, them head tipping over and then preventing airflow that way. So yeah, enlighten us. So um, the, only, the only safe way for kids to go in a car is in a car seat. And I can, I can the, probably the easiest way to explain that is to step through what would happen in some of the alternative scenarios. Like what would happen when you use a sling? What happens when no one uses a seatbelt at all? What happens if you share a seatbelt? So we can talk about that a little bit. Um, But in terms of how kids should go into a car seat, yeah. So kids should be rear facing for as long as humanly possible. And that's longer than you think. Okay, so how help, long is that by any to help by, anchor yeah. your expectation? <laughs> you should aim for at least four years old. We are so facing a like four years old standard would be right. like if you were if you if you want to get like like medals, then you're going to shoot for the gold the, the gold medal, right? <clears throat> the silver medal would be to, to stay rear facing until two, and the bronze medal would be to stay rear facing until nine months. Okay. Um, now it is very possible to keep your kid rear facing until eight. So my okay. five and a half year old is a, a big, burly Aussie kid. <laughs> He's going to be part of the front row in Singapore's 2038 Rugby World Cup team. <laughs> Him and his brothers. <laughs> and um and he's rear facing and he's super comfortable. He likes it more than he does when he has to sit forward facing, say when we take a taxi ride. And, um, and it's possible. And it's, he just thinks it's totally normal. And he's like, why on earth don't all my friends still, still sit rear facing? Poor them, maybe we should tell them. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. So yeah, so kids need to be rear facing, but there's rear facing and there's rear facing. Right, so newborns have a special type of rear facing car seat that lets them recline. Mm. So with newborns, you need to balance the um, the rear facing kind of like the, from a pure theoretical perspective, the more upright the child, the safer they are in a rear facing mm. position. Because if you can think about me I'm sitting rear facing in a um, car accident, if I'm mostly upright, I simply move backwards into yeah. the shell of my car seat. Yeah. But if I'm like at 45 degrees, then when the, uh, in an accident, I'm gonna move backwards a little bit, but I'm also gonna move upwards a little bit. Right. Okay. So the more recline they are, the more they rely on the straps to keep them in place. Yes. And mm-hmm. that's gonna put pressure on different parts of their body. So the safest way is if they simply push back into the shell of the car seat. But with newborns who, have, who don't have neck control, uh, we need to we need to balance the recline angle with their um, with their airway. So yeah. typically, most infant car seats will be at forty five degrees because um, that will enable the child's chin not to be touching their chest mm. and uh, and whatnot. So <clears throat> um, yeah, so stay rear facing for as long as you can. Um, and so if we if we have a quick talk about what would happen. If yeah. you wore a sling, right? So let's. Have, did, did you ever wear a baby carrier? 
I did. All right, let's talk about exactly what you did. You tell me what you did. You sat down, did you put a seatbelt on? I did. Where did it go? Uh, it, so I put the seatbelt on and it went across uh, her back. Okay, okay. So if we just go play by play, and this is not to be scary mm. and nothing happened, so you're not to feel bad. And awareness and knowledge is key, right? Yeah. So I'm not trying to make you feel bad that you didn't yeah. know this or do this at a time because when we know more we can do more and that's yes. cool mm. so <clears throat> let's just think about what would happen in an accident so you know how seat belts when you jerk the seat belt or if the driver breaks suddenly the seat belt locks in place yeah that's a safety mechanism and that's how the seat belt is designed to work mm. um, now in an accident what happens is you're traveling at a speed and then you, you decelerate so quickly that actually everything in the car experiences G-forces, kind of like what a fighter pilot goes through. Yeah. And during that really rapid deceleration process, everything in the car feels like it weighs more. Yeah. Like, like 10 to 50 times more. Right. Wow. Okay? So your baby feels like they weigh not five kilos, but 50 kilos. Mm -hmm. and if you're 60 kilos you actually feel like you weigh 600 kilos right okay so you are 600 kilos of weight moving forward in the accident but the seatbelt is locked but the baby is between you and the seatbelt you're moving forward and the seatbelt's staying still and so the baby is squashed between yep. now if you um Let's say you put the seatbelt behind your back or something like that, okay? So that's going to keep you, like your, your legs in place, but your torso is going to move, okay? What happens in that case is you, uh, you fold, mm -hmm. okay? Another option might be that, um, like, you wear a seatbelt kind of, like, across your torso, but you, you, don't, you don't put it over the baby, okay? So you're being restrained, but the baby's being held by the baby carrier. These baby carriers are only designed to hold what some of them nine, some of them 13, some of them 15 kilos worth of weight. But in those split few seconds of the accident, remember your baby's 10 times heavier. Yeah. So she's, she's actually 50 kilos. Right. And she's decelerating at such a rapid rate that the baby carrier just is not made to hold on to that. Right. So um, they've done crash tests in Australia of what it looks like to have a baby carrier. In, in a crash test scenario. And within 0 0.2 seconds of impact, the carrier just disintegrates as if it were not there. Wow. So all of those options that we just talked about are out now, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's no way that in a genuine crash, they'd be able to do anything. Um, and then the last option that a lot of moms talk about is, well, I will just hold my baby in my yeah. arms, right? I'm strong, I have a maternal instinct, like I'll hold on to her in an accident. So two things happen when the accident occurs. Keep in mind that this happens in less than one second. Yeah. Okay. The first thing that happens is you have um, a survival instinct, which trumps your maternal instinct. Okay. Right. So your body's gonna, your brain's gonna force your hands up to protect your brain. Okay. Mm -hmm. so you can't hold on to the baby if you did manage to hold on to the baby though she weighs 50 kilos and she's traveling at 50 kilometers per hour yeah um, while you're stopping okay because you're the only thing that's trying to slow her down yeah and so you just physically like in in half a second you're not able to like catch 50 kilograms yeah right so okay. that was a very long and convoluted way of no but it. it's a very I could, I could try again more succinctly <laughs> I think you ex I think it was fine because I think that's the that's very important for people to know because I think a lot of people do I I mean I, maybe I'm generalizing but I think a lot of people do use carriers and and go into I don't think you're generalizing the statistics no? <laughs> say that you're right okay yeah. All right. So um, then let's talk about like what is available then on the market, because like I, I got mine from the U.S. and obviously it was just it was so confusing to try and put that in. Um, do does Singapore cater for carrier or, or car seats here? 
that is for the Singapore taxi or grab system? Yeah, so every single car seat manufacturer, pretty much all the big guys and all the smaller but middle guys, everybody makes an infant car seat. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and almost 99% of those infant car seats can be installed in a taxi in Singapore, mm-hmm. and 99% of them click onto your stroller. Yeah. Okay, so using a car seat from birth is, is like, uh, other than when your kids are like out of primary school, that's the easiest possible time that you can yeah. have to buckle the kids up. Um, and like most people who have a car, they still even use that kind of technique because you're able to keep the sleeping baby regardless of whether they're in the car or or, or in the pram. Um, So um, one thing to keep note of though is that um, most of the car seats, not all, but most of the car seats sold in Singapore are European. Right. Almost all of the seat belts in our cars are European. And so they're compatible. Okay. But seat belts in American cars are functionally different. I see. And uh, American car seats are designed to work with American seat belts. Ah. And so 99% of American car seats are not naturally compatible with a European seat belt or a Singaporean seat belt. What would and be so the slight will... difference? Sorry. So uh, European seat belts have like they just work one way, okay? When nothing's going on, they move. Mm -hmm. And if the car breaks or if they're jerked, they'll lock. And that's it, folks, okay? Okay. That's like normal seatbelt function. American seatbelts have this second hidden function that's genuinely called child restraint mode. And the way that you activate this second feature or the second function is you slowly pull the seatbelt until it's completely out of the retractor. Like you've got pools and pools of seatbelts being pretty. And then as you let, as you like let the seatbelt go back into the retractor, you'll hear a ratchet noise. Like, Mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Now, no matter how gently you try and pull the seatbelt back, it's not going to come anymore. It's Mm. permanently locked, Mm -hmm. okay? So this is the mode that you would need to engage if you were using an American car seat. But most of the, like, the vast majority of taxis and grabs and private cars in Singapore don't have a seatbelt with this second mode. So you would need to apply some other way of permanently locking the seatbelt if you were using an American car seat. You may use the base, but if you have a taxi, that's not practical. Mm -hmm. Um, Or uh, some of them may employ a European technique. Mm -hmm. Um, Or thirdly, you may, and this is the most common way, you may need to use a locking clip that's separate. Now, in the US, they don't really use locking clips that often anymore because for the last 20 years, these two-stage seatbelts have been mandatory. Right. And this is where it can get really confusing because the manual for your car seat, it mentions it really quietly in the corner, but it doesn't harp on about it because they're not expecting you to take a US seat out of America. Right. So um, it's just a big red flag to be really sure of. Um, Even if you buy the seat in Singapore and it's American, whoever sold it to you may not even be aware of this right. unique situation. Right. Okay. So then when should parents start investing in a car seat, you think? Like when they're when the mom's pregnant? Absolutely. Anytime. anytime. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And you should do it when you're looking for your stroller. Because mm. you want your stroller to be compatible with your car seat. Yeah. And most people, they do that fine. And honestly, the way that most people do it is they will buy their stroller and then they go look for a compatible car seat. Yeah. I'd recommend you do it all together because most of us don't have a car. Mm. Right. Mm. And when we think, you know, looking for a compatible car seat, we look for the baby seat only. Yes. But there are not very many toddler car seats that can go in a taxi. In fact, there's only two. 
And not all of the strollers are compatible with one of those two toddler car seats. So like one of the biggest mistakes I see mums make is they'll spend $1,600 on a beautiful pram that can only take an infant car seat. Yeah. And then, and then they get to, you know, somewhere in the baby's second year of life, they need to change to the next stage car seat. And all of a sudden they can't use the pram that they've invested heavily in. And so can you find car seats that actually cater to newborns all the way till toddlers already? Or do you need to change it then? For taxis specifically? Let's, yeah, let's say for taxis specifically. There is just one. So there are only two toddler taxi friendly car seats. One goes from birth and one goes from nine months. Oh, really? Okay. And they fit onto a pram as well. They click onto a pram as well. They don't click, but they they can they will officially go with a number of prams. Mm-hmm. Um, they sort of they sit in it and then they are strapped in. Ah, so do you need a, so, a separate mean, device for that? Then do you need a, a separate no, strapping it's, device? It's, it's, it's it part comes of it. With the stroller. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, it's just you know it doesn't have a handle and it doesn't have a sunshade. There are lots of reasons why you would want to choose a baby only seat and then change to a toddler seat later. But if, you know, if, if, if budget is super important, it, it's totally feasible to go straight to just that one seat. So then when, um, I mean, in terms of would people, so I guess the, the, the answer is that most people could find this one magic one where you could have it from, newborn all the way to toddler but on average most people it's probably expected that they would invest in maybe two right so one for infancy and maybe one for toddlerhood and then one for school-aged children yeah the whole notion that you can just have one car seat has a couple of inherent flaws in it i mean there are some products on the market not for taxis but for your own car that uh, sort of advertised to be all-in-one car seats. Yeah. And as with any other all-in-one product, yes, it can satisfy the basic minimum requirements at each stage, but typically you are making big compromises at each point. They're also very bulky because remember this has to, you know, kids should be using some kind of child restraint until at least 12 years of age. Right. Okay. So you think of a car seat that can fit a newborn and have that exact same car seat fit a 12 year old. Mm. And you, you can get an idea that, that that car seat is going to be a lot bigger than the yeah. car seat that only fits a newborn to two year old. Right. So they're also a lot more expensive. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think you need to look really, really closely at what it is that's making you want to just have one seat and kind of pick that apart a little bit. You know, is it is it about value? Well, actually, if you just got like two or three fit for purpose seats over the whole lifetime of them, they'd add up to the same as that all in one seat. Right. You know, is it that you don't want to have to think about it again? Well, yeah, that's fair. But you know, if you're committing, you know, if you think now about when we look back and have a look at car seats that are 12 years old, they look they look Jurassic. Mm. Okay, yes. like I don't know whether, you know, a lot happens in car seats in two years. I don't necessarily want to commit to using a 12-year-old car seat in 12 years' time. You know, like if, if I just got a car seat for two years or for four years, imagine what awesome amazingness I could get at the end of that time for the next stage. Mm. So then are there car seats that are, obviously there must be car seats, so how does a car seat design sort of change I mean, because you say about five years is when they can go forward facing. Um, And so are there car seats that go up until 12 years of age that is like the full shell and everything and for forward facing? Yeah. So so typically there will be a rear facing car seat and then you would move into a forward facing car seat and then you would move into a high back booster seat. Uh Uh And that's where it has the shell of a car seat but instead of um, having its own integrated harness that you buckle up at the front, the vehicle seatbelt would come across the front of the child. 
So they're broadly the three stages of car seats. And there are a few seats on the market that incorporate all three stages into a single car seat. But as I said, they're going to be making compromises at each stage and they're very big. Right, right. Okay. So... Hmm. All right. Cause that's, that's really interesting. So then the ones that, for example, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to name brands, but there are some brands where the, the pram essentially folds in and, and it becomes a car seat on its own. Yes. So there's one. Yes. yes. Duna. Duna. <laughs> yes. And, and so is it, is it what, I mean, I guess it, it's a decent enough brand cause it's quite convenient in the first, I don't know how many months, maybe like if you have a tall baby, maybe nine months maximum, and then you kind of like outgrow it a little bit. So the Duna has the same lifespan as any of those other infant car seats. And that's right. typically sometime in the child's second year of life. Mm-hmm. So if you have a petite girl that has a short torso and carries her height in her legs, I've seen girls like that get until beyond their second birthday in their infant car seat. Right. If you've got an enormous boy who carries his height in his torso rather than in his legs then he's going to outgrow that a lot sooner the Mm. the the earliest I've ever seen a baby outgrow their infant car seat was nine months and that was like like a massive outlier even big kids will typically get to at least one but it's not age is is broadly irrelevant when you're looking at when a child is growing out of their car seat right so what is that what's the determining factor of when a child is growing out of their car seat then what are the signs torso height yep so when they're sitting down how tall they are and their total weight okay so their torso height if it's higher than the back and their head is out of the car seat essentially or not even that far it should be much earlier than that (laughs) I can get super academic and I'll try to be really brief. It varies on every single car seat. Yeah. So you absolutely must check the manual. Broadly speaking, European in rear facing car seats, the child's head needs to be inside the shell of the seat. Okay. American rear facing car seats, the head needs to be um, at least an inch away from the top of the car seat. Oh, wow. Okay. So they have to be even more shorter than the than the height of the car seat but the american car seats tend to be a bit bigger anyway right and then what about the legs do the legs have to be you know can they still be folded that's like one of the best myths around yeah a child can have enormously long legs it's not unsafe and it's not uncomfortable for them right okay all right so then would it make more sense to then have uh like a like a consultation for example with you after they've had the child because then they can gauge sort of like the length of the child or it really makes no difference then nope so you need something when you come home from the hospital yeah so you need to have bought your car seat before you go into labor Mm -hmm. and all of the car seats will fit well if you're buying a car seat for a newborn like you're Everything. fine yeah. yeah like whether the kid is five centimeters taller than the other kid that was born it's 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 not a big deal um actually fitting your newborn into the car seat can be really tough so yeah. uh oftentimes um on discharge day parents will video call me and i'll say oh just shift her butt over to the left or you know turn her head to the side to make sure that her airway is open that kind of thing um but uh, obviously, like once that car seat is outgrown, then knowing the proportions and measurements of your child is very important for buying the next car seat. Uh, but no, like with a baby carrier, you know, like a baby sling, it works much better if you wait until the baby is born yep. before you're fitted. That's right. Car seats aren't like that. You should buy the car seat when you're pregnant. Right. Okay. Good note. Because um, then, for example, if people are not necessarily using a cab, let's just say, right, like they go out of the hospital and they're using public transport and that's fine. Um, and maybe they typically never u- really use a car. I mean, I would I find that hard, but I'm sure that at some point they'll use a taxi. But, you know, um, let's say they just never, they always rely on public transport and it's only the pram. Then are there recommendations on what type of pram a person should be or if may, are there no-goes of a type of pram maybe I should say because I'm sure there's so many yeses but like are there some no-goes of a pram no so there are 
hundreds of thousands of prams in the market. Yeah. And every pram is perfect for somebody. Yeah. But is that you? <laughs> so, you know, if your best friend bought a Bugaboo B5 and thinks it is the best thing in the world, that is awesome. That's amazing that she found a pram that perfectly suits her lifestyle, her car seat, her budget, her child. But is it going to be perfect for you? I don't know. If you happen to answer all of the lifestyle questions identically to her, then maybe. But um, most of the time, it's not. Yeah. Okay. So then should... Maybe I should be asking then, like, when they come for a consultation with you, what are some of the things that they should, because I think you're probably the only pram and car seat consultant in Singapore. Am I right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, like the, I'm like the Hogwarts sorting hat for baby here. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm a you, grumpy yeah. of it too. <laughs> are you? <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. Be like, and you get the no. Um, and <laughs> we'll go there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then, would would do you have the range in your in your facility essentially to go? Well, this is so a parent goes in saying, should they be coming and saying like, this is what I'll probably need it for. These are the things that I I usually do, and this is what I'm kind of looking for. And then you have like a suggestion range of what you're probably you can show yeah I, I, if this is a podcast no one can see your hands that's but true just going to a very big range yeah <laughs> so um the answer to your question is yes and no no and yes okay um, and what that means is we're like a modern baby shop we're not a traditional store so um what would happen in a traditional store is one of the first things you do i mean you might read some reviews but one of the first things you do is you just go and browse and have a yeah. look and yeah. you walk into the baby shop and you are confronted with walls and walls of prams because every yes. baby shop, like, we have an amazing range. Come in and have a look at every single, you know, they think the more prams they put up, the better it makes them look. Um, but that's just overwhelming. Yeah, you it know, really is. If you, by chance, are lucky enough to get the attention of a sales assistant, <laughs> which is not always something that's easy to do, um, you know, do they have the time to sit and chat to you about your lifestyle and your needs and what exactly are you looking for? And if, even if they do, do they have the comprehensive product knowledge or better yet, the personal experience to be able to give you good advice on what would genuinely suit you versus what they're going to make the most margin on? Yeah. Plus, they may look like they've got a good range because they've got so many prams up on the wall, but... If you say, oh, actually, did you have, oh, my friend's got the other baby vista. Do you have that one? And they're like, oh, no, we don't carry that one. Okay. So <clears throat> cut to the modern way to buy a pram. And you book an appointment with us. You get the whole boutique area just to yourself, like mm -hmm. to you and your husband. Um, and before you pop in, you fill out a quick questionnaire. And that's where I get an idea about your lifestyle and your budget and the kinds of features that you've heard of and you think are super cool. Um, are there some brands that you're already aware of that you want to take a look at? And then based on that, before you even come, I send you a recommended shortlist mm -hmm. of brands that would suit you. And I send you a video that compares just your shortlisted prams because wow. your first question is well great i'm glad these four prams are on my list but what's the difference between them yes. yeah. okay so you just get to chill back with a decaf coffee while i'm there on my computer talking to you about you know this one can go up to 21 kilos but this one over here goes to 22 kilos so you know and then when you finally do come in our whole boutique space is curated just for you so it's got the prams on your shortlist. If you'd noted that there were any others that you were particularly interested in, it's got them out as well. I mean, if when we're chatting, something else comes up and I'm like, actually, now that you say that, there's probably another brand you can consider. I can just wheel that out, okay? But the space is not overwhelming. I mean, mm. the space is beautiful. It's like a yeah. black and white house in here. Ooh. If you kind of, um, you know, you come in and you can have an espresso coffee and dad can have a beer <laughs> um, and you know you can have a cookie and we just have a chat like it's just you and me and the space and you just get you know it's like um for me buying a pram was the worst part of nesting yeah 
for me, carrying or my, watching my husband carry the massive pram box home on the MRT, that was a highlight, but for him, I don't think it was. Okay, so you know when you, um, this doesn't happen to me often, but you know when you go on a long haul flight in economy, yeah. that's definitely the worst part of your holiday. Yeah. But when you go on a long haul flight, in business class, yeah, that's the highlight of your holiday. Like you're taking pictures, and they're yeah. really featuring heavily. <laughs> um, you know, my hotels are not as nice as the business class. <laughs> that's what this is. You know, um, now buying a pram is one of the highlights of nesting. Mm. Okay, and in my lifetime, I've had eight prams. Right. Um, but the two prams that I have now. So I have three boys under five, right? And now yep. I've got two grams. The two grams I have now, if I had bought them way back uh, at the beginning, I would never have bought pram um, three, four, five, and six. Right. Okay. So, okay. you know, having a pram that's genuinely compatible with everything about you is mm. a lifesaver. Plus in Singapore, your pram is your vehicle. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's your car. It's your family yeah. vehicle. Yes, very much so. And then so when they come and then they say, okay, this is the one I'm going to select because you're not necessarily a retailer, will you tell them where to go purchase it? And then it can, well, are those prams available to get into Singapore, I guess? Yeah, no, well, that's the beauty of Pram Clock. So now we are a retailer. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and, you know, we, we have all of these added services. Mm-hmm. So you know, when you go and buy a car, they give you free servicing and free detailing. So when you buy a pram from us, you get a year of free cleaning and a year of free servicing. Nice. When you buy a car fleet from us, you get a year of free installations and a year of free cleaning. Um, one of the biggest pain points for new parents is they get their car seat home and then they go through that nesting phase where they've got to wash everything. Yes. Okay. And the washing of the car seat, super easy. Hmm. The reassembling of the dried car seat is not so easy. Yes. So we even have a pre-wash service where once you've picked the one that you want, we'll wash it, dry it and reassemble it before we send it to your house. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Guys, please, you know, please, please, please definitely take uh, this up because I, I would so do it next time when I have a kid. Uh, the one is just okay right now. So <laughs> not jumping on that bad wagon just yet. But I would definitely because I remember I think I remember getting in touch with you when I was thinking about it. And then because we got the one in the States, because uh, my husband was there and I was just like, it's cheaper, get it, get it. <laughs> and he was like, okay, I think I can manage it. It's a huge box, but fine. Um, and then he did. So then we, we never followed up. But then, yeah, it was that first experience from the hospital just going, we have this car seat and now we don't know how to put it in properly. Even though I read the manual from back to front because we don't actually have a car or a taxi obviously like we just don't know how to put it in and yeah it was kind so of we're just- full service we're like singapore airlines so we'll teach you how to use it you can video call me on discharge day and i'll give you pointers yeah we're we make it easy yeah so then when do you think typically parents what, what is your recommendation when parents should come in is it like basically in the third trimester yeah sometime around the second to early third trimester you don't want to be um, shopping for the big fundamental baby gear too late for two yeah. reasons. Mm-hmm. One, you're uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, you're, we're done. Like, yeah. you're just ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, and secondly, if, like me, your baby comes unexpectedly early, then you may have ordered your pram, uh, but yeah. it hasn't arrived yet. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so that's what, that's what happened with us. Um, and... Yeah, just, I mean, especially if you, you know, want to make sure that it's cleaned and stuff before you want to use it. It's one of the, it's one of the like key pieces of baby gear that is actually super important to have early on. Yeah. Okay. And then what if, uh, I mean, obviously if, if parents are expecting twins or triplets or quadruplets, uh, but I mean, that's rare, but you know. One of our customers had twins. She has a a four-year-old she had a four-year-old and then she had tri- sorry not twin triplets wow. and they didn't have a car so they were taking triplets and a four-year-old in taxis <gasps> that's a lot of car seats <laughs> it is 
Yeah, she's a massive pro at it now. <laughs> really? I mean, that must be just like logistically how to carry all those car seats as well. Um, well but yeah, so, so you need you need a pram that, I mean, there are no prams that will officially take three different car seats, but you need a pram, you know, like that can, that can make it work. Yeah, and, and are there prams that can make it work? Yes. Ooh, okay. All right. Good to know. So you, want, okay. you want a double pram that's compatible with two car seats, a very big basket, and then you baby wear the third and have the third's car seat in the basket until you actually need to get in the car. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. That's... And a buggy board for the top. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So then... Um, I think it's safe to say that whether you're going in a Grab, even if the Grab has their own car seat, uh, which many of them, especially if you're taking the family versions, they are supposed to have a car seat. It's still... Yes, but not infant car seats. Yeah, so you okay. you can Grab family from one year old. Right, okay. So it's still worth uh, considering having a car seat uh, for any child, basically, under the age of five uh, in Singapore. It's and essential. Then- it's essential it's essential so it would be definitely worth always uh popping down to your shop and getting a consultation and getting this sorted because it's something that grows until the child is 12 years old as you said so i mean you think about all of the things that we do for our Mm -hmm. kids you know we're super strict about their vaccination schedule we make sure that they eat well that they go to school well um you know, over 500 children every year are rushed to KKH emergency because of car accidents. Right. And the vast majority of these children are unrestrained. Mm. Now, preventing vehicular injury is yeah. an, a really easy thing to do. Yeah. But it's not something that you, like, have a second to try at. Yeah. Right? And, it's, it's, and so, yeah, like, like of all the things that we could be doing, preventing injury and death, by simply using a car seat every time we jump in a car. Hmm. It's important, it's practical, let's just do it. Yeah, and if like, for example, if parents were doing this thing where you were, you were I think you were gonna cover it, where they put the child and then they strap this child on with them. So they might put the, the waistband across the child, but then they put the, the torso band on the parent itself. So it's not going across the child. Is it worse than having nothing on the child? at all or both are just as bad it's 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 equal it's equal yeah okay so the worst thing that you can do is share a seatbelt or use no seatbelt at all yeah mm. then the next like it's kind of like the, the the way to think about it is like steps or ladders okay yeah. and each time you take a step up you add a little bit more pr- protection mm. so that's the bottom no seatbelt or sharing a seatbelt the next step up is where the child just uses a seatbelt yeah and that's wildly impractical for a baby but if you're talking about a child aged you know four to twelve where they physically can sit down <clears throat> then using a seatbelt is better than using nothing but it's very close to the bottom of the stairs yeah the next seat up would be the, the next step up would be using a booster seat or a harness mm-hmm. the next step up would be using a forward facing car seat and the next step up after that is a rear-facing car seat. Right. So <clears throat> there's a balance, right? The yeah. further up the staircase you go, the safer your child. Mm. But the further down the staircase you go, the more convenient it is. Yeah. So we experience the convenience factor every mm-hmm. single day. Mm. We don't experience the safety factor. We're not having car accidents every single day. And so um, one of the ways that our brain uses to compute vast amounts of information is it uses biases or heuristics. Okay. And one of those heuristics is called the frequency bias. Mm -hmm. And it's where your brain is genuinely wired to say something that happens more often must be more important. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, and so because we're experiencing that convenience factor every single day, our brains are actively working against us and telling mm. us that that's more important than the safety factor. Yeah. Okay. That's very important to note. Okay. Um, I think really quickly, because this is all really great information and people I'm going to be putting, uh, you know, Elisa's um, details in the show notes below. So please definitely get in touch to get your consultations in. I know I 
I have to because I don't have a child restraint device for a three-year-old yet and I've been doing something very not so safe so mm, I, <laughs> I would but be when working. you know more you can do more exactly and yes like, like 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 we're super pragmatic about about this I mean the the you know there are some people especially overseas where the car seat culture is a lot more ingrained who get a bit evangelical about it and they're looking for gold standard best practice yeah. you know mm-hmm. for me if I can get a kid who wasn't in a car seat at all into something that may not be like the the absolute best potential product but if, if they've had an improvement in safety then that's a win okay yeah. so yeah. if if you feel somehow like obliged to buy you know a rear facing car seat that's you know say we're talking about a two-year-old you, you feel obliged or pressured to buy the, the very top step on, on yeah. that hierarchy but it's not something that's genuinely functional for you it doesn't mm. fit your pram or it's it's not practical for you to take if you're only using that 80 percent of the time yeah that's no longer the safest option right you know if you were to take one step down on that hierarchy but you chose a product that you could use 100 percent of the time then mm. for your family that's the best option for you right so okay. it's not about fear and judgment it's, <laughs> it's about <clears throat> using what we know mm. to make informed decisions about what would genuinely work best for your family yeah. So then would you say that you, you became a car seat engineer because of all the research that you did, essentially? <laughs> or you actually went and did something further because you said you were a chemical engineer? Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm a chemical engineer and I'm a specialist in car seats. Okay. So if I worked for Nippon Paint, I'd be called a paint engineer. <laughs> okay. All right. I mean, so I'm, uh, I'm Australian. I've got Australian and American qualifications in car seat specialty. Oh, wow. Okay. And um, I think just very quickly is uh, I'd love to also touch upon this recent endeavor that you started, uh, which I'm very honored to be part of the Little Black Bump book. Uh, Yay. Yes. The first copies have come through. Very exciting. Could you share with our listeners and viewers what this is all about? I would love to. So the Bump book's a curated directory for soon to be mums. So <clears throat> I'd have a lot of mums coming to the shop and I'd say, you know, uh, after a while we get talking and I'd say, oh, um, uh, do you have a doula? And they say, what's a doula? And I'd mm. say, oh, I'll tell you about that. Have you joined Stork's Nest, this Facebook group? No, I haven't heard about that. And um, and so I, I would be kind of, every single time I'd be scribbling down all these notes and be like, well, don't forget to call this lady if you're having trouble with breastfeeding Um, or, you know, definitely go to these prenatal classes. And that happens all over. Like the doula that I often recommend, she's doing the same thing as well, right? Like scribbling out all these notes for each mum. And we already all recommend each other in this beautiful, organic, informal network. And so it was just a matter of putting all of that down. I mean, when when my first son was born, I had all of these massively unrealistic expectations about motherhood. I'm an only child, so I never grew up seeing anybody else raise a child. Mm. Um, and my only exposure was other mother, was mothers at cafes. Yeah, and that's same. not representative, folks. No. No. <laughs> And I had these ridiculous notions that I'd be this amazing mother earth and my child would never cry because I'd have this magical bond and I would just instinctively know what to do. And that did not happen. <clears throat> you know, I, um, I was like, no, I don't want, I was talking to my mom, I was like, no, I don't want any family to come over. This is a beautiful bonding experience. You can come over in two months time. And like the day we came from hospital, I'm like, mom, we're booking your flights. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I just didn't know that there was help to be had. I yeah. didn't know that there was lactation consultants who would come to your house. Yeah. I didn't know that, um, you know, if you had problems down under, you could see a women's health physio. I didn't even know they existed. I didn't know there were physios other than sports physios. Yeah. I didn't know so much. Um, I didn't even know they existed. And if I did know they existed, I didn't know where to find them. Yeah. So this, I mean, I had a super bumpy transition into motherhood. Mm. And if I had the book, I hope it would have been 
a little bit more gentle because mm. Having most of my friends had really bumpy transitions into motherhood as well, and it's traumatic, Same. and it really yeah. tarnishes your memory of the of the first you know while with a newborn. And um, in the book, so there are twenty one chapters, and each chapter covers a different specialism. And at the end of each chapter, one of my friends has written um, a letter back in time to herself. Mm. Um, you know, telling herself stuff that she wishes someone had told her. Yeah. And um, I can't honestly say I have enough friends, but <laughs> um, a lot of my friends were like, I'm sorry, I can't write that letter. That's too traumatic. And everyone else who did write the letter, they were like, it was really cathartic. I've been crying for two days. <laughs> um, so, you know, all of us had mm. a really rocky start. Yeah, we did. And and just making that a bit more normal. Like mm. not everything is beautiful, wrapped babies with fake flowers and baskets on Instagram, you know? Like, yeah. like it's it's falling asleep on the couch with the baby on your chest and then worrying that they're going to roll off. Like I don't recommend yeah. that. That's terrible. Yes. But that's what yes. I did. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the absence of our literal physical village yes. has really impacted us and so this mm. is this is the, our little modern village and everyone's whatsapp number is in there like you just yeah. call them and you're like i need your help yeah <laughs> and tell us where can we get this book or oh, where can viewers and and listeners get this book yeah so from the partners so there's over 100 perinatal specialists in the book so if you happen to be a client of one of them then you can often get it from them um, you can also get it uh, from the littleblackbumpbook.com um, and eventually we'll have it on amazon and kanakania and whatnot mm, nice and it's available in both hardback or hard copy as well as an ebook version and yes. for listeners and viewers, I also have my own link. So if you ever want one, please get in touch with me and uh, or please and 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 we'll give you a, we'll send you a copy as well. But yes, wonderful. And um, at least if we could just like end this wonderful conversation, what is the main shift that you want to create in the world with your work? Uh, I want women to not feel so overwhelmed, isolated, and alone during that first stage of motherhood because I did and it's awful and it doesn't have to be that way. It's not some yeah. mandatory rite of passage that you have to slog it out on your own. Mm. We need to stop trying to reinvent the wheel and yeah. ask for help. Mm. Yes, very much so. And on that note, thank you so much for joining us today on Shift with Shibra. Thank you for all the information. If you are interested in Elisa's uh, services, the uh, show notes will have those links below. And Little, Bl Little Black Bump Book as well, sorry, will also be in the show notes below the link as well. Thank you so much, Elise, for joining us today. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks, Shibra. Bye. Bye.